I am such a big fan, and I love the book, but I've also, of course, loved all the work that you've done at Jimmy Choo, and I think because I love the shoes, to read the story behind was so fascinating. Tell me a little bit about the backstory. You were frustrated as a young person and trying to figure out the next gig. Tell me a little bit about how that led to the creation of, of Jimmy Choo. Well, I started my career as an assistant at British Vogue, and I was the accessories editor. So we're talking uh, back in the early 90s. Well, some of you may remember, there was only one shoe designer around, and his name was Manolo Blahnik. So as an editor, I got very frustrated in finding different things to photograph. So there was a cobbler in the East End of London, and he was making bespoke shoes for private clients. And I would get him to make things for shoots. And so I'd go to his studio in the East End, which, by the way, was behind barbed wire. And if you stepped outside that, you'd pretty much get mugged. Um, and we'd sit there, and I'd say, OK, I'm doing a gladiator story, and I want it to look like this. I want it in silver with studs. And he'd make it, and I'd photograph it and put his name in Vogue. And I started thinking that was kind of when my light bulb moment happened. I thought, well, this is a great platform to start a business from. You had a wealthy family that you came from, and you would end up marrying a wealthy man, and, and yet you describe sort of all that wealth as a challenge, I think, because you really want women to know about being, having their own wealth and their own financial independence. You call it a gilded cage yeah, to did, have a wealthy husband. I did, yes, I describe it as a golden cage, um, because really you want to take responsibility for yourself. You want to be independent. And the reason I was so driven to work and create a business and become financially independent because I want to make my own decisions in life. I want to pay my own bills. And I never want to feel dependent on anybody. I want to know that I can rely on myself if things get bad. And because you never know how life is going to turn out. Things did twist and turn in my life. My father died. I inherited nothing. I got divorced. I ended up paying my husband a settlement. So it didn't really work out the way people thought it might work out. At the same time, it was interesting, the double-edged sword, in a way, of, of wealth. And, and I've actually seen the same thing in contract negotiations as a reporter, where if people think that you are making any amount of money, they think that they can lowball you. That yes. you'll, explain that to us. It's, you know, what I find particularly as a woman, it happens more. And I think this is something that we need to talk about more, is our own value. Because actually, when we start our careers, we don't value ourselves enough. And then that affects us through our whole career. They've done some research, and it's actually been estimated that women probably lose a million dollars over their career by starting at a low value. Hmm. Interesting. You know what's interesting when you talk about no value, and what I found frustrating in your story was you were clearly describing all the work that you, you were Jimmy Choo, and yet you kept stepping back and sort of saying, oh, no, no, I'm just the one designing the shoe and marketing the shoe, <laughs> and, and li literally <laughs> listing all these things. There's the cobbler who was getting a lot of the attention of Jimmy Choo, but no one was really giving you the credit that I think was due to you. It's, it's, again, it's because I didn't value myself enough to step forward and say, hey, wait a minute, I'm, I'm doing this. Um, you know, and people say to me, well, why didn't you change the name of the company? And I felt, well, you know, I'd already got in, we were set up, so I carried on doing it. And also, I didn't really have enough self-esteem to do that at that point. But, you know, I'm curious to know for women in this audience, and this is, it was such an interesting point for me in, in the book, um, how do we navigate through that? Because I think that is a typical thing. You were the creative director, and, and you had a partner who really wasn't doing much, if any, of the work, and yet you were constantly reluctant to sort of step up and say, actually, everybody, I am running this. And, and by not stepping up, there would be implications for you down the road in dealing with your CFOs and dealing with the companies that would end up buying Jimmy Choo. No, exactly. I mean, I wish, in a, in a way, I wish I'd had the confidence to step up. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, they call it imposter syndrome. And most successful women suffer from it, that you think that one day someone's going to knock on your door and go, hey, we know you just lucked out <laughs> that you didn't really, you know, you're not really that good. Um, and I think that's, that's basically what it was. And I think that's why it's so important now for young women to get mentors. And I'm not saying you have to have a woman mentor. Get a man mentor. Um, because I've actually been working uh, with a great guy recently. 
who's been helping me with my business, and he's seen what it's like to work from a woman's point of view, which has been really interesting for him as well. Is there a reverse of the imposter syndrome where, in fact, some women and some of us wait around for someone to come by and say, you know, we have noticed the good work you have been doing for the last 10 years. You're amazing, and we're gonna give you a raise and a promotion and throw you a party, because I think sometimes we wait for that too and not sort of fight for it. A lot of your book is, is kind of the fight to find your voice. But yeah, we, uh, we end up working ourselves to death, hoping someone will notice, um, and that doesn't usually happen. Was it hard for you to resign from the company that you had built and literally given your life to? And, and there was a lot of chaos happening around at the same time. It was. It was, it was a huge decision. Um, that was a very risky, frightening decision because I knew that if I stayed, the wealth that I could create in the next five years, um, but then I knew that it, I felt like it, it had destroyed my soul. Um, so then I felt if I left, I'd be young enough to take the risk um, to try and do it again. But if I'd stayed another five years, I probably would have been a little probably too old to do it again. So I think that's a classic um, challenge, right? Yeah. For all of us on the cusp of making a decision is, all right, let me chart it out. Here's the, you know, the pros and the cons. What was the thing that pushed you over to make the decision? Um, it was really doing what I'm happy doing and believing, I finally started to believe in myself. And just for me, it's about the joy of creating the product, um, no matter how big or small the company is, but it's the process of creating a product that I love. So that's what I really want to do. And if you do create a great product, the rest usually follows. You write a lot about the conflict between the creative types and the creative work and then the suits whose job is to sort of manage the process. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. It's, it's a very common conflict, particularly in the fashion business, um, where you have to merge um, you know, the creative side you know, the, and with the commerce side. And it's, you know, because the creativity is intangible. Creativity, uh, when you're designing in fashion, it's an emotional connection. If you go into a store, you're, you're going to buy something because you feel a visceral reaction to it. Um, and that, you can't put that on a spreadsheet. You, in the book, detail a lot of these sort of challenges that you were having with your spouse and with your mother, who's completely crazy, in ways that <laughs> anybody who has a crazy mother in this audience has not even come close to having the crazy mother you had. How were you able, how did you navigate those times? I mean, you were going through so much, and there were times when I thought, you're raising your daughter as well, trying to keep a semblance of sanity, yes. have a business that you're running and trying to keep profitable and dealing with all kinds of craziness interpersonally. You know, if it wasn't for my daughter, sorry, I'm getting very emotional now. Um, I actually don't know if I could have carried on. Why does it make you cry? I saw, you know, I was very emotional when I came here today. I think because it's such a large audience of women and I'm um, so proud and honored to be here. And I have my daughter backstage. Oh, she's backstage. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't have a chance to say hi to her. You write a lot about her. She's really, you know, she's brought me um, so much inspiration and joy and the drive, you know, to go on has really been, um, really I've dedicated a lot to her. Was it hard for you to go through all of these things and you're busy and working through the night and you have a small child who I'm sure I, I know personally, you always feel like you're not quite there enough and you're running out as they're going to school and you're running back as they're coming back. That's true. You f I mean, you know, you've been guilty since the day they were born, right? So it's... Um, I've it's just settled on having a D, <laughs> getting a D grade for, you know, for parenting <laughs> generally. I'm, I'm going to pass with a D. Um, it's a juggling act. And I think, um, you know, it's not always the quantity of time, it's the quality of time. And, and I think it's about the moments that you do have being really present um, because you can have plenty of time and be in the same house and, you know, never pay attention to each other. So I think that a lot about is quality rather than quantity. You said she's your inspiration. Was it in all of the battles that you were literally going through? She seemed to be a real she, center. She really was. Um, it was really, you know, uh, just 
because I wanted to, you know, win for her too. So that's what kept me going. Mm, interesting. Um, how were you able to manage keeping yourself health? I mean, as a new CEO, I read this book through the eyes of like, you're running a company and how could you keep yourself sane and healthy when some of the fights that you were having were just completely ridiculous? I mean, and maybe this is a silly question, but I kept thinking, well, how are you even able to get up in the morning and go meet with those lawyers and go fight with the, the, the company that's trying to buy you and meet with your employees and argue with people who are trying to steal your ideas? What did you do to center yourself? Did you do anything? Um, I guess, you know, for me, just being at home was a luxury. So I tried to rest when I could and, you know, a very simple exercise. You know, it was, I actually did exercise quite a lot through that to keep myself strong and mentally strong. You've got a new business venture, which you have finally put your name on, which yes. I was glad oh, to see. Yes. Did it take you, was it hard? I mean, I felt the same way at times. Like, oh, I don't want my name on that. Oh, I don't, you know, it's not about me. Was it hard for you to do that? Because to me, it seemed like a, a step forward. Yeah, it really was. I mean, because in one way, you know, it's, um, you feel more under the microscope. <laughs> Um, yet at the same time, it, it feels, it felt good. I felt very ready. In fact, you know, by the, by the time I left Jimmy Choo, I'd almost mourned it while I was in it um, because I'd been through three private equity deals. I fought off a hostile takeover. I, I mean, it'd been a whole series. The, the book is a nail biter. <laughs> if you haven't read it, it really is like so anxiety inducing of how this is going to turn out. So, so that, that was sort of the case. That, yes. Really, I think I, would, I just got to the point, I think, where, where I, was, I was ready. What was your biggest lesson? I mean, as you now start a new venture, what do you look back and say, you know, I did that really wrong and I will never make that mistake again? Okay, there are three things when I talk to um, young students, um, especially fashion students who want to set up their own businesses. I say there are three things that you have to remember. Now you have a magic number, and that magic number is 51%. Mm. Keep control of your business. <laughs> because, yeah, um, and the second thing is get a really good finance director, but don't let the accountants run your business. And the third thing is know who you are. What does that mean? I think that um, many of us struggle with knowing who we are and, you know, and, and maybe we're one person one day and something else later in the week. How do you know who you are? Well, there can be many vision, different versions of who you are. They can be sort of different parts of your personality. You know, one day I'm the warrior, next day I'm the teacher, next day I'm the nurturing parent in the office, you know, but you still have to, I think knowing who you are is really just not wavering not wavering on the things that you believe in, your values, your instincts. Don't waver. When you know something in your gut, don't let someone push you around. What do you hope that your daughter has taken, because she, she was little, but she sort of has been through this tough experience with you, and you've come out the other side, um, and you do, I think we all do so much for our children to sort of see the example as we go through it. What do you hope that she has taken from all of this um, I hope that she can take away a good role model. I hope that she can take away how important it is um, to work, be financially independent. Doesn't matter, big or small, but just something to look after yourself. Um, I hope that she's also taken away how great women are. Um, women are really amazing, and I think that we have to get rid of all the myths that are made up about women. And there are so many. There's a lot. Finally, because we're running out of time, how did you figure out who could be a, a mentor? You were running a major company. There was a, a fair amount of drama in it. And sometimes I think as you rise up, it's hard to identify the executive you know, who, can, who you can confide in, who's not going to take those secrets and turn them around and use them against you in some capacity. How did you, how did you navigate? And, and how can everyone here figure out, well, who's the person that I can then help me leverage what I'm trying to do um, and that I can feel comfortable sharing with. I actually called people who were in my industry and, and I took the risk. I didn't know them that well. Um, people who had had uh, grown businesses bigger than mine. 
um, and I asked them for their help. And it's surprising how willing people are to help. Um, I don't know if anybody here knows somebody called Philip Green. He owns Topshop in the UK. I didn't really know Philip very well. But in the last exit, I called him and I said, you know, Philip, I'm having a really hard time. Will you have dinner with me? He called me every single day to check on me until I sold the business. And that was pretty incredible. And you know, you, you've, you find that people do want to help. And right now, you know, I'm very lucky. Um, I have someone helping me who I'm lucky enough to be dating. It's called Michael Ovitz. Um, and he has been a great mentor, business mentor as well. I'll leave with just one thought because um, you said something that I think women have a hard time saying. You called him up and said, I'm having a very hard time. And I was thinking, wow, I'm not sure that even if I were having a hard time, like, would I call up someone and say that? But it, that seems to be the magic. That is the magic thing because um, I hated to ask for help. I hated to bother people. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be, I'm really sorry. Can I do, you know, I didn't want to bother anyone which is the opposite that I've found to what men do. Men have no problem asking for help. They have no problem calling people on a weekly basis. They have no, and people actually, what I discovered, they really don't mind. It's great advice. Tamara Mellon, her book is phenomenal. Thank you so much for being with us today. What Thank a pleasure you. to have a chance to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.